All right, in the interest of showing you how I use my brain, uh, I collected together some things that I just put in over the last three or four days. Now, each of these came in from some different vector, meaning one of them was an article in the New York Times, one of them was uh, a meeting I had with a friend where we got into a conversation about the history of Portland and highways. Uh, another one was a video they, that I ran across uh, about things I care about, about uh, healing of trauma. So each of these is very different. I just created a node here called 1606 New Notes, which means 2016 June. I do things a lot uh, by, by year month because they sort nicely then uh, when I go someplace. So for example, if you, we see my event schedule up here, uh, we'll see uh, a few different things that are on year month uh, orientation. There we go. So these are different things that I've done this year. Uh, so let's go back to uh, where we just were. And uh, I'll start with um, Carl Safina, who I actually had never heard of before. And uh, I already had a thought in my brain called, do animals have feelings? So one of the things about all the things that I'm going to show you now is that uh, these nodes and the books and uh, Twitter accounts, so here's a book beyond words, uh, which is what prompted this whole inquest into Carl Zafina. Somebody mentioned on a conference call that I host uh, the book. I didn't even know it was a book. They mentioned Beyond Words. So I Googled Beyond Words, and that brought me to all of this. So Carl Zafina turns out is an, is an ecologist. He's at Sunny Stony Brook, uh, and he cares a lot about this notion about animals and feelings. And he's, you know, do animals actually have feelings? Uh, and I had the topic animal well-being and a couple other things in here. I also have a thought, do insects have feelings, believe it or not? Uh, all these, of course, under feelings and animals. Uh, so here's Carl, and uh, he wrote the book Beyond Words, but he also uh, was, uh, he also gave a, a TED talk, which I then watched. So I annotated the talk by saying that uh, ele elephants, for example, can distinguish between tourists and herders. Safina uh, describes an experiment where they recorded tourist voices and they recorded herder hunter voices and they put the speaker out near elephants. And when the speakers had tourist voices, the elephants were just fine. They just kept on walking because tourists aren't annoying. They don't hurt you. Uh, when they played the herder voices, the elephants started running the other way away from the speakers. So they understood that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I have this under what makes us human and also that we are very unaware of our relationships to nature, which I think I need to make more profound. Um, he talks a bit about the cruelty we inflict on animals. So I put it under cruelty to animals. And as you'll see, I've got quite a few things under cruelty to animals. And then also I connected it to uh, TED Talks because this is a TED Talk, and I've been doing this for a while, but yeah, these are all TED Talks. All of these are TED Talks, and in fact, there's another thought for TEDx Talks. So this is just the TED Talks, and I differentiate between TED Talks and TEDx Talks. So that's very funny. Uh, Clay Shirky has apparently done five different TED appearances, uh, and I, I love Clay. He's a great, uh, great speaker. So if I go back to Carl and connect back up to Carl, uh, by the way, anywhere you see a link next to a thought, uh, that means that if I click on that link, it'll launch my browser to that page. So here we are going to Carl Safina's Wikipedia page. I use Wikipedia pages when somebody has one as their sort of canonical starting point. Uh, and it turned out Carl did, so that's what I did. So that's just Carl. And all of that probably, except for listening to his TED Talk, which is itself an 18 minute adventure more often than not, uh, but all of that probably took me 15, 20 minutes to do. Uh, granted, I, it wasn't central to anything I was doing that day, and it was a distraction, as all these things are. But in some strange way, I'm, I'm busy weaving the context of life. So on from there. So I had a conversation and learned that Portland, the city of Portland, back in the days of the, National, the Federal Highway Act of 1956 and the interstate highway system that resulted, uh, Robert Moses and his team went around the country basically basically showing cities what they should do to install freeways, which would meant uh, knocking down housing in different places and had lots of ill effects as well as some good effects. Uh, and then they offered, the Federal Highway Act offered funding for this. So they said, we'll cover 90% of the cost of installing freeways around your city. Uh, Portland has a couple of freeways that cut through it, but then they said no. And what I, what I didn't know, and that was really interesting, was that there had been a series of highway revolts. 
uh, that many cities around the country actually said no, including Sydney and Australia. It wasn't all in the U.S., uh, but cities that, that had planners come in and say, you need these kinds of freeways in this many, in some cases, not all. We have many cities that were really, really cut up by freeways. Uh, and the, the famous instance of this is Jane Jacobs standing up in New York for a freeway that was going to go through the village, the, uh, the part of, of New York that's sort of actually organic shaped uh, in different ways. So what was really interesting about the jujitsu part, though, was that uh, Portland managed to change some wording or use some wording uh, in, in the funds they were offered to use the funding that was supposed to go to freeways. Originally, it was going to be the Mount Hood uh, Expressway to fund their light rail system. Uh, so Portland actually funded their MAX system and some of their other uh, uh, tram system uh, with money that was supposed to go to federal highways. That is an, a tremendous irony because there's something known as the Great American Streetcar Scandal. Now, all of this existed before the last four or five days. In fact, this, uh, these nodes are pretty old because I've heard about this for a long time. But if you've uh, seen the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is right here uh, in 1988, it's a movie actually based on historic events. It's a cartoon uh, uh, directed by Robert Zemeckis, has Bob Hoskins and Christopher Lloyd in it. But there was actually uh, a great American streetcar scandal where General Motors, Firestone, and others uh, invented National City Lines, which was just a, a fake company, and then proceeded to buy up streetcar systems around the country and shut them down. Uh, there's a lot more to it, but basically 80 cities around the U.S. had delightful light rail systems. In Los Angeles, it was known as the Red, the red Line was the famous one. And uh, amazingly, they, they burned the cars and dug up the rails, knowing full well their goal was to sell bus fleets to all these cities, which they did. They're, but but they knew that once you've pulled up the lines and burned the cars, how's somebody going to reinstall a light rail system? So the irony that Portland manages to use highway funds to fund to fund uh, uh, a tram system is delicious. Even though I don't believe that Portland had a tram system that got pulled up before that. All of that from a conversation where I learned about that on Portland and just came back, did a little bit of googling and put all that in. Uh, then I had never heard of a woman named Vivienne Ming, uh, so I watched her TED talk, uh, it's actually a TED Med talk, about uh, incentive insensitivity and about the fact that um, fanatics, people who really care about stuff, are, are insensitive to incentives. They will stay on something regardless what the motivation is. In fact, I connected that to a thought I already had before, that extrinsic motivation often erodes intrinsic motivation and that rewards and measurements often don't really work, uh, which is tied up to a really important thought that's up here on my, uh, on my uh, pin board called my beliefs. So this is part of my belief snapshot. Uh, so we're, we're kind of linking up to that from this whole notion about intrinsic and extrinsic or endogenous and exogenous rewards. So that was the paradox of insensitive sensitivity. I'll do a couple more. Uh, then there was a terrific uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Actually, not an op-ed. Uh, Judith Shulovitz is actually a New York Times correspondent, I believe. <clears throat> so I put her under New York Times correspondent and a journalist married to Nicholas Lehman. Uh, and here's her Twitter account. She's written a couple of different really interesting things about uh, parenthood and uh, the role of moms and so forth. Uh, also a book about the Sabbath, about uh, looking at time differently. But this one on how to fix feminism was really interesting. It had a lot to do with valuing homemaking and about work, uh, work-life balance, women b balancing career and family, which uh, is a topic I have under work-life balance, uh, which is a topic I have next to women in the workplace. Uh, so there's, you know, Hollywood ageism against women, Rosie the Riveter, career women. Rosie the Riveter, of course, should connect us to World War II. Let's see if it does that. There it is, World War II. <clears throat> but if I go back to how to fix feminism, uh, it's also linked to articles about feminism. And she coins the term caregiverism. And she says that givers of care really are, are under underappreciated in many different ways. Points to some really interesting books. Finding Time is one of them, which I had not heard of. So I put uh, Heather Boucher and uh, Finding Time in the book, in, in uh, my brain, which I didn't have before. And then also uh, The Time Bind is another good book. And one thing I didn't realize uh, was how really crippling TANF was, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, which passed under the Clinton administration, under welfare reform. 
uh, and it replaced the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, which had been doing a pretty good job of protecting uh, families and children. So they, they made sure, oops, I made a mistake there. I wanted to put a parentheses in at the end. Um, so they made a mistake there. Uh, anyway, let's go back to, uh, I'm clicking on the breadcrumb trail down below here to go back to where we were. Then there's going to be uh, published any day now, which is one reason why I'm making these videos, uh, an episode of the Cool Tools podcast about me and my brain. Uh, Mark Fraunfelder and Kevin Kelly are the guys who run the Cool Tools podcast. Uh, I've had them in my brain for years and years, know them both personally. Oops, and that was my brain crashing. Uh, so let's reopen it. I'm using the uh, Brain 9 Beta. So um, it crashes a little bit now and then. I was just thinking I should close it and reopen it because that usually clears things up and it doesn't crash. Uh, so if I go back to the Cool Tools podcast, that will take us back to 1606 Cool Tools on Me and My Brain. And I was just going to show you how much I had on Kevin Kelly, which fetching that might have been what caused it to barf on us right then. Uh, so here's Kevin Kelly, the books he's written. Uh, in fact, in fact, sorry, uh, I have so many things connected to Kevin Kelly that I have a separate node that I colored so it would stand out on the list uh, of just his books. And I'm not I'm not guaranteeing that these are all the books he's written. In fact, I know that he's, he's written more than this, but these are the ones I have in my brain where possible. There's an Amazon link so you can go buy it uh, and the year of, of its initial publication. So he recently put in a whole bunch of work uh, publishing The Silver Cord with Steve Masseroni, which is a graphic novel, uh, which is really quite outstanding. Uh, in fact, it was a, a crowd written science fiction work that he then turned into a graphic novel in different ways. Anyway, uh, there should be a Cool Tools episode out pretty soon, and those of you who follow that far enough will end up right here. And then finally, I will go to, uh, I'm not going to do all of these, but uh, in fact, I'm going to do most of them, but I'm going to go to the American Slave Coast, which is the book I've been reading. I'm probably 40% through it. Uh, now I don't know how thick books are anymore because I read them in my Kindle app on my phone. Uh, but this book is really tremendous. It's blown my brain. Uh, and I mean this one, not this one. Uh, he, uh, Ned Sublette, who uh, my wife and I met in Havana on a trip recently where we went to speak at a conference. He was also a speaker at the same event. Uh, he wrote this book and talks about the slave breeding industry, which is much darker than I thought uh, America's past was. And he really... He really talks about the, the economy of the South and he refers, he, he, among the many, many interesting things he says, which have really stuck in my head, he says that the U.S. Revolutionary War should really be seen as a successful civil war. It was the colonies splitting away from the U.K. and establishing their own governance. So they, they broke away in a civil war and created their own governance. But the motivation was really mostly a slave dependent economy preserving slavery because the UK uh, went toward abolitionism first. Uh, British ships could no longer carry slaves. They blockaded Africa. There's a whole bunch of interesting history here. Uh, Americans saw that coming and the South in particular, but the North also completely complicit, were so mixed into this that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't go that way. It's really quite amazing. Uh, then he says, look at the US Civil War as an actually functional, more or less revolution because that's what broke the back of slavery. And of course, 100 years after the Civil War, we had the Civil Rights Movement, and we still don't have equality. Um, but the history here is very difficult. Uh, all the founding fathers are completely complicit. The documentation about, in particular, South Carolina, what is up with you, South Carolina, uh, but Virginia, all these different states, what they were doing, how they handled it, uh, explicitly what was going on in, in Congress and before that in the Constitutional Convention and, and, and so forth uh, is really quite incredible. So th this thought, 1606 New Nodes, I just made so I could tell you the story. Um, I think I'll end here. But I wanted to give you a flavor for what happened over four or five days. Each of these probably took me a half hour to do. The Slave Coast I've been reading now for a couple weeks. So every now and then I'll add a little something to it. Uh, but this is what it's like to annotate things in your brain and then have them connect up uh, to things you've already put in before. And don't worry, you don't have to have as many thoughts as I do for that to start happening. Um, thanks for listening and uh, keep coming back.
subscribe if you like this.